So I am actually extra excited about this one um, because if you caught the news this week, if you read the news like I do, you might know that uh, Scale of T, we hired Mark Rogers this week, joined us officially as our uh, chief security officer. Uh, he had been an advisor uh, since for a while now, really uh, kind of helping us out from a kind of a big picture perspective because Mark has a, a long history as a security professional, um, recently was at Cloudflare and um, most famously probably I would say you've been running uh, head of security for DEF CON for how many years now, 25? 25, 25 um, well, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was assistant director for about 15 years and uh, head of security for five years or so. Yeah, so. Nice. And Mark Too is long. a <laughs> strong believer in Beyond Corp, which is why we're so, so excited to have him here. Um, really brings a lot of credibility, I think, to, uh, to this community and this ecosystem. Uh, so there's some of the things I want to talk to you about today, and you've, you've joined panels about Beyond Corp. You talk a lot about security as a business enabler and never as, as a blocker. Now, Beyond Corp kind of represents a fundamentally new architecture. How do you see this kind of uh, security architecture helping security become kind of an enabler? So, I mean, probably one of the first things I'd, I'd refine about that is so security should be blocking the attackers. It should be blocking the bad guys, but it should be enabling the business. And what I've seen in, in many enterprises, and I've come from businesses of all, sh all shapes and sizes, from giant telcos to construction companies, and you see the same problem. And that is people believe that security is about building big walls. Build big walls with big gates and you'll keep the, the barbarians from getting in. The reality is all that does is it makes things more difficult. If any of you have been in a big enterprise where uh, someone has to enter in uh, two-factor authentication to get to a firewall to get into production, you, you'll know that there are often cheats that people use to get around that, to quickly deploy things. But if your people can get around it, so can attackers. And we've seen examples of this when you see things like WannaCry. WannaCry devastated enterprises across the industry. And the reason is, is because once you get past the tough perimeter, there's absolutely nothing to stop lateral movement. Yet, if you look at what some of these systems are doing, why is your SharePoint system trying to talk to your domain controller uh, and access resources that aren't ne are, are normally never accessed from that system? These are things that we should be able to call out and stop. Um, good security is something that enables people to do what they need to do in a, f in a frictionless way but with intelligence, so that when someone tries to take that, leverage it, and do malicious activities with it, there is a decision that's made. Whether it's to alert or stop, it's entirely up to the business. But the opportunity is there, now we need to start leveraging it. Yes, absolutely. And you know, it being a new architecture, it's gonna take some, obviously, some, some convincing. Um, but the, you know, the perimeter model, I think, it seems so obvious that it's starting to kind of break down, but people are still kind of stuck to it. What do you think is going to be that, that thing that's going to really get people across the line, hopefully not always getting breached? Is there a pro proactive way to say, all right, I, I believe that this perimeter is no longer the way? I think people are already starting to go across the line. Hey, zero trust in many ways is, is take two for security because hmm. for 30 years, ever since the internet worm, we've been talking about defense in depth and compartmentalization and how we should break things up so that if something goes wrong catastrophically, it only affects a small area. But no one really ever explained what defense in depth meant. And so there was a lot of interpretations. And again, it led to people building walls within walls within walls, which just led to more problems for businesses. And so businesses started tearing them down. I think one of the things that's really helped with moving things across is actually DevOps. With DevOps, they faced, uh, developers faced a very similar problem. The traditional model that compliance wants to see is that code will get pushed into a development environment, will then get pushed into a staging environment, will then get pushed into a production environment. In practical terms, that meant sometimes it would take weeks or months for code to ever reach production. And that's not good enough in a world where you need to make changes almost on a like, real-time basis. So DevOps came along to create streamlined workflows that people could use to push code in a, in a reliably, reliable and consistent way that met the spirit of what people were talking about with having different environments, but without the, the friction that was put in place. Uh, that 
is exactly the same kind of model that we should be using for security. Automated processes that make decisions based on intelligent information that allow the right things through and either block or alert on the wrong things. And the tools are, are around now, so we're now reaching critical mass. The only thing I'd say um, I, I worry a little bit about is there are a lot of companies who are using the words zero trust and, and mm -hmm. using the terms uh, like beyond corp, and they're building intelligent perimeters. That's good, and it's a great starting point, but if you're building an intelligent perimeter, how are you different from the castle and moat scenario? You know, once someone gets in, lateral movement is still possible. I can give a really good practical example from just three years ago, um, Tesla Motors. Tesla Motors has a really uh, well-developed network, a lot of investment in security, firewalls, Splunk, the works. They use OpenVPN for secure transport from vehicle to their infrastructure to the, to the mothership. But the reality is to bypass that, all you need is a screwdriver. Get a Tesla, motor, uh, Tesla Model S car, unscrew the 17-inch uh, console, pull it out, take out one of the SD cards, put it in your laptop, boot up OpenVPN, and as far as Tesla's infrastructure is concerned, you're a car. Hmm. And the car is allowed to talk to the factory. And now you can access all sorts of things you shouldn't. The same problem exists in apps. I, I spent a while, uh, a year and a half ago, tearing apart apps, iOS apps actually. Um, I found that you could uh, open them up, uh, instrument them, and then use an enterprise certificate to put them back on your iPhone and play with them. And what I found was like nearly 50% of the applications out there put secure credentials inside the application. Well, if it's in the app, anyone can get it, and anyone can pretend to be that piece of code or, or that system. What's stopping them from leveraging that access to get further? What you need is an intelligent infrastructure that is always questioning. That, to me, is what zero trust is. It right. is questioning at every level, at every point of the network, and checking and rechecking. Yes, he's using valid credentials, but is he doing what he should do? And in, in a way, it's almost like a funnel. At the start, all you need is credentials to get in. But as you move down towards systems, you can start asking tougher and tougher questions and checking and, uh, more and more detailed things. So that if someone uses a set of credentials, goes into uh, an instance and starts deleting data, and that's not a, uh, a permitted activity or an activity that normally happens, you should absolutely be able to alert on it. But if all your uh, zero trust network is something at the perimeter, unless you're inspecting everything all the time, which is just not effective at scale, then you're never going to have that opportunity. Right. Imagine spending all of this effort building this new zero trust security architecture and then still having static credentials as the mechanism for logging in. You need the, the credential mechanism has to match the architecture. And if you're continually reevaluating trust based on whatever the surrounding conditions are, you have to be able to do that attestation of trust um, it, to match. How do you see matching credentials with the kind of uh, security architecture of, of, of a zero trust? So I think credentials are important. Right? There's, there's a lot of talk about throwing away credentials, no passwords, uh, using biometrics. Personally, I think biometrics are being used in the wrong way. Biometrics should not be your password. Biometrics should be your username. Because biometrics just proves that you are in possession of a device and are doing something. So you should take that. It's a good piece of information to have. You should take that with some form of credential. Doesn't have to be necessarily a very complicated credential. You should take that with information about the device. Is it clean? Is it, sa is it safe? Is it in compliance with policy? Does it have an encrypted disk if that's a, a mandatory part of the policy? Bring it all together and use that to make a decision. And it's about making informed decisions with all of the information available. And there's a lot of information available and a lot of different ways to get it. The number of companies here in Silicon Valley who have released phenomenal tools, things like OS Query, that allow you to challenge systems and get solid information about what's going on is great. If you look at uh, hardware, things like um, ARM have secure elements inside them that can be leveraged to provide a really robust way to identify a particular device. 
but none of it is individually foolproof. It's only when you bring it all together into harmony that you build a strong uh, posture. I always believe that security is, is never infallible. Right? Security at the end of the day is just a, you must be this tall to ride barrier. Um, our, jo our job is to push that up as high as possible, but without slowing the business down. Got it. And you, uh, you mentioned uh, you know, DevOps as kind of a, a, a key enabler in kind of making these more automated environments. And you've got you know, cloud services make this a lot, uh, a lot easier. What are some dangers of, of too much automation if you're not looking at it correctly? Well, so I, I'd actually also say that cloud services don't necessarily make it easier. They often make it hmm. harder. Um, one of the biggest challenges I think most businesses face is data fragmentation. Most companies don't know where all their data is. So when Verizon had their S3 bucket, or, or rather one of their, their uh, third parties, S3 buckets popped, and all their call center information spilled out, did they even know it was there? The chances are they didn't, and that's like a huge problem. Yeah. So automation can be great, but blind automation is almost as dangerous as, as having no automation. The yeah. trick is, to still have humans in the process, but to save the humans for where they can make complex decisions that add value. The simple stuff, like just checking a device meets policy, checking it's the device you think, all of these basic decisions, that stuff can be automated and handed off so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, makes sense. And it speaks to a lot about uh, what Evan from Segment was saying earlier about these kind of automated environments and making sure that you're, you're doing, doing it all properly. Now, this, this sounds like um, you know, we're, we're changing some of the architecture. The way that we traditionally deliver and deploy security software um, has been, you know, drop this appliance here. Now, this doesn't sound like this is going to fit. What do we need to do to change the model of delivering security software to fit with these kind of automated DevOps environments? So I think one of the most important things uh, I think about this is to actually listen to how your business works and operates. Security delivered from an ivory tower is one of the worst ways to deliver security, period. I hate security organizations that just slam policies down without knowing how people work because nine times out of ten, it becomes a blocker or it adds friction or it, ca it causes headaches. It doesn't have to be that way. You can learn, you can adapt, and you can build into, as actually Evan was saying just before, build it into the workflows that these guys are doing so they don't even know that it's going on. There are great tools like from the DevOps standpoint. Like take Go, for example. There's an open source tool called Gas. You can use Gas as part of your CI pipeline and plug in all of the OWASP uh, rule set to it and have it check for common mistakes. There's no need for these common mistakes to get out into the real world. If you look at some of the bug bounty stats, it's actually genuinely quite depressing. Close to 80% of the money that comes out of bug bounties is going over to places like India. Why? Because these guys are setting up sweatshops that run things like HB Web Inspect, and they're finding low-hanging fruit. That low-hanging fruit should never get out there, and it's a sign of a lack of maturity in security processes that's not picking up this kind of stuff. There's no excuse for that. Don't hide behind a bug bounty program Use a bug bounty program to drive maturity. Mature security is good security. That it is. And you know, I, I don't necessarily like the term DevSecOps, but uh, you know, the, the, pra the, the practice of injecting security into these kind of automated uh, DevOps environments makes a lot of sense. And if you approach it from that perspective, you know, the human angle you mentioned earlier, you know, when you, you look at a lot of the, the kind of architecture of Beyond Corp, it's very reactive. Um, where do you see potentially inserting kind of proactive security controls if you have the supporting architecture and automation where a human can kind of say, all right, I see something here and I want to you know, adjust accordingly? So I'll say one, I think one of the key metrics of success for uh, zero trust is that uh, I've seen, uh, I can't remember who it was now, I was listening to some of the conversations at RSA and they're talking about how the only way to do zero trust properly is to throw everything away and start again. Do, who here wants to sit in front of their CIO or their CTO or their CEO and say, hey, you know that $5 million, $10 million network investment you've got? Yeah, we're going to throw it away and we're going to start again. 
No one wants to be in that position. It doesn't have to be that way. So I think one of the first measures of success is how we can leverage good security practices into workflows using the existing investment in security. And I believe that's doable. Some things will have to be replaced, but you don't have to throw everything out. And it also doesn't have to be, um, uh, it doesn't have to be constrained. It can adapt to everything. So this problem of, I've got great security on my Windows systems and okay security on my Linux systems, but I've got no security on my Mac systems, that doesn't have to be the case. Because if you build the security at every level, all the way through from system to system to system, deep into the network, then as you mentioned before, the device is an important point, but it's not the critical point. Right, it's an input into yeah. that, yeah. Makes sense. Um, so there's an ecosystem kind of forming around this new architecture. What do you, what do you think, um, you know, us as, as vendors, how do, how do we approach companies that, that see this new architecture and believe in it? How do you come to them without saying, rip, out, rip it all out? You're like, how do you get them to kind of believe in it and kind of take it step by step? You know? I think, <laughs> honestly, the best way is to lead by example. Show mm -hmm. them that you can build secure, intelligent networks where uh, deployment can be accelerated and not slowed down. One of the analogies I like to use when I talk about security and control is why do cars have brakes? Nine times out of ten, the answer that people come back to me is so they can stop them. Well, yeah, that's true. But if you actually look at the point when brakes were invented in cars, it led to a step change in the top speed of cars. Why? Because the additional control gave confidence and ability to go at higher speeds without worrying that you're going to end up in a fiery wreck. It's the same with security. If you build security in in a sensible way that's frictionless, that's intelligent, the business has confidence to, do, to move on and potentially make more risky decisions because at the end of the day, business is inherently risky. Our job as security practitioners is to quantify that risk and to control that risk. I love that analogy, and um, it, it speaks to a, a, an early point when you talk about maturity. So if bug bounty programs are kind of meant to mature your software, you know, it seems like that's, that brakes matured the car to make them go faster and, and evolve. Um, what's the next maturity for a kind of zero trust uh, ecosystem or architecture, you think? <laughs> I think understanding how to deal with security issues. Mm -hmm. um, I see far too many companies, especially here in Silicon Valley, see security as something that they build in at a later stage. Security is not something you build in at a later stage. For years and years and years, we've learned the lesson that the cheapest time to build security is right at the start. And, and it hasn't changed. We need to look at how we can bake this in right at the start to make sure that what we build is secure and with a secure foundation take it forward and build it further. Got it. Perfect. Well, we got a couple minutes, um, and I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to ask Mark their toughest questions. Any, uh, any questions from the audience for Mark? <laughs> Come on, don't be shy. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I talk to a lot of people who do the React and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I keep asking them, now, why do they not put security into the daily API? Into the... Oh, yeah. APIs are actually, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 it's one of my soapboxes. If you look at security in the browser, security in the browser has evolved phenomenally over the last five to 10 years. You've got good separation, sandboxing, you've got policy control, you've got threading control, um, policies. It, it, it all makes sense. Credentials are passed securely. You support the latest ciphers. And then you look at APIs, and they're lagging. You look at like, big companies like Zendesk, and they're still offering plain authentication where a password and username are sent in clear text over the wire to authenticate something. Or they're using a token, which if you capture it, you can replay it. Why doesn't uh, an API have the ability to immediately pin certificates to ensure that people can't Masquerade. Why are there APIs that accept self-signed certificates? 
we've invested heavily in one side of uh, our control and, and interface, mm. but almost nothing in the other side. Yeah, you have to cover the full spectrum. And yeah, every tutorial on how to build an API says, insert random string as an API key, key here, and you're fine. Uh, so I, I could see that. But I, th I think maybe, were you asking about password controls in terms of no, no, having to reset your password or add a ca capital letter? Huh? Bounds get rejected the automatic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I totally agree. Yep. Uh, there are so many of these decisions that are, are, are no-brainers, and it's just yeah. building them into the right points of the network, but also making sure you don't just build them into a single point of the network. Preventing lateral movement shouldn't be that hard. I mean, completely preventing it can be challenging because at the end of the day, there's always a risk that someone will come in, use some credentials, and do only what that account is specifically authorized to do. That's really hard to stop. But on the other hand, stopping them from abusing that, stopping them from downloading your entire database, stopping them from rebooting your entire infrastructure, stopping them from deleting all your AWS instances or accounts, these things should not be hard. They still are. So we still have some education to do. Uh, I but that's why we're security. here, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, any other questions? <laughs> No. Yeah. No. All right. Well, Mark, thank you again so much for uh, for joining us. Uh, Mark, Mark could be around all day, right? So if anybody wants to stick around and ask the the tougher questions, not we'll quite here. all day, but we're around for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Pleasure. All right. Thanks, buddy. <laughs>